It's a lot better option. I think you're the first person in any one of my classes to have a history. It's not an injury. That doesn't that, that's true. That doesn't. A, a mark. A hammer. <laughs> a scuff. Uh, but the, the work it takes and the effort it takes is, is a lot, but the payoff is huge because you literally become a medieval tank. And you can go anywhere and do anything you want. Once you put your armor on, you're a, you're a god on the, on the battlefield. Because anyone wearing Lanolar or, or just, they also had these other ones that were, were just layers and layers of, of tar and, and uh, wool. Yeah, tar and wool layered together and sewn until the point that their needles broke. That's when they knew to stop sewing this, to get these things together. And so that guy, even though he's covered in like this much, you know, hardened tar and wool, he's gonna die. My sword is gonna, my point of my sword is gonna go right through that with a lot of, you know, it's gonna be a lot of effort. I'm gonna have to throw my whole weight into him, but I, it's not that hard to do. And he throws his whole weight against me, I'm gonna push back. That's the other thing about chainmail. You'll see these stupid idiots putting chainmail on a flat surface and punching you with an, with an arrow or something with these big things, you know, this flat hard surface, and bam. Well, that's half of what chainmail does. The other half is the padding underneath it and the fact that it moves. Those are the, it's a three part system to make chainmail work. It has to have padding and it has to have a person that's willing to move. Most people are willing to move if they're getting hit. Absolutely, I'm willing to move out of the way, I'm willing to take the hit. I'm not going to just stand there going, you can just keep hitting me. I, I'm not an idiot. I'm not the incredible ball. I know that. And that idea of, well, let's break chain mail with this or that and the other, it, that doesn't really how it works. Until you had a point where I could be able to, to fit this into a visor and just ignore the plate and the chain mail, the hundreds of hours you worked on your armor, this ignores that. This doesn't care. If this had a point, instead of being the the, fin, the, uh, the blunted version, this is actually a piece of metal blunting it underneath this, this rubber pad and, and uh, electrician's tape. But otherwise, if I threw my full body weight again with this, I could punch through anything. Anything. Metal, uh, if you're wearing bamboo, if you're wearing any it happened. Also, people stopped using it because you had those pikes and you had guns, and that's the only reason chain metal was fading out, is these point weapons ignored all of the armor you were wearing, especially your, your head armor and your chest armor, where you can't really give as much here as you can on the arm. You know, your arm will bend back and go all the way over here, but your chest, it can't bend as much. And so that's where, where you would get hit, that it would, would actually damage you and, and kill you from these things. That's because that wouldn't work. Weapons like the Guggentop, which is basically a 10 foot pole with a big chunk of uh, pine wood that's literally this huge hammer on a 10 foot pole, that's, it means good day in German, because the guy would swing it and going, Guggentop, Guggentop, and he would just <laughs> hop it off heads. Because, because this, that's what he was designed for, because he knows that it's not going to pierce this stuff. So he's gonna do is he's gonna break your bones inside of it. Because he's not gonna punch through it. So he's just gonna squish you inside of it and make and, and make you, you know, toothpaste, squeeze it out the middle. And that that idea is one of the reasons why you if you look at armor, you look at weapons, realize that these things really worked. Because otherwise, <laughs> you're dead. <laughs> so you don't you don't you don't mess with these things. We're, we're getting towards the end of the class. Could you open it up to questions? Please? Yes, please. That's actually where I'm, where I'm at right now. Go okay, ahead. Great. Any questions? Uh, question. Please. You said that you use these uh, objects. Uh huh. Do you, do you use it for training? Or objects? I do. I do we use historical recreation, historical re reenactment, or the site of creative mechanisms. I, I use all. I use most of this. Actually, the Groget, I use. Uh, last night, uh, and, uh, and it works really well. Reenactment, for example, like for History Channel? No, no. just as far as those. Okay. Uh, to, just, just to understand the history and understand 
what it was like. Because one of the things that was interesting is people would make these things father to son. There's no manual on how to make a chain mill from the from time period. Right. Because you just teach your son how to do it. And there's no manual on how to fight with uh, most swords until the rapier because you had you had really wealthy people in the Renaissance willing to spend money on, on how to make a, do, how to do this in a book and how to and make these uh, big huge things up, up until then you were you wouldn't have a studio with 15 guys teaching you'd have two three guys you're teaching so you didn't need a book you you just do it yourself. So you're saying it was a true partnership that was handed it was, down. It was that and the fact that it's dead. It, it was, we are rediscovering it because it kind of died out when people stopped doing it because nobody had made a book about it. Nobody had made a manual on how to do it. So it kind of died out. So that's one of the reasons why Society of Creative Actions, SCA, exists, is to rediscover how did this really, what are the details of how this really worked? And how do we, what, what kind of good stuff can we learn from this age of, of how things worked and how things were run and how things uh, really made things better? So when you're saying about all these uh, protective shields, which one would you bring back into the war zone? Uh, when I was in the army, I would have preferred to wear chainmail over uh, what, we, what we were wearing because I couldn't. I, when you're wearing your plate, uh, you can't bend forward. You when you bend from the you bend from your hips, and it actually hits your hips. So you bend this much. That's as far forward as you can bend. You can't really bend back at all. You can bend this way, but there's a plate there, so that's as far as you, you're still straight up. You can't bend more than that far, and so I can't. You can't. You're extra 50 pounds, so you can't really run. And so it, if you, it, it won't deflect a knife. It won't, uh, and it will only deflect one bullet, one time each plate. Mm -hmm. You got one shot. When did the crossbow become greatly used? Because I know the bolt was called the nail killer. Um, that was. Um, just after Agincourt, which is uh, 1530, something like that. Uh, no, the exact year, early to mid 1500. Uh, and really, it was a male killer during siege. When you're in a, when you're in a pitch battle, uh, that's why Britain could match up to him, because Britain used their bows. They didn't use crossbows. They used their bows because they trained their people on it. There was laws requiring all their people to be trained on it. They outlawed soccer. They outlawed football. They outlawed which were two different things at the time. Uh, soccer was actually more like our, our American football. Um, but they outlawed every other sport but bows. And they do their bows. But crossbows, you don't have to train someone so much on a crossbow. And you don't have to really have strength. That's the biggest part. Training people on, on bows, you can do that. You can do it in an afternoon, have a chance, do it, and, and get it to it. Problem is, you, you will come back after that day of knowing how to do it now, exhausted with a crossbow, or, or you know, full body cranking, and then you put it up, and you can keep doing it over and over and over. So in a siege where you've got six months of, of people coming at you, that's a much better option to, put every, to get everybody a crossbow. And because you could do that, France did it, Germany did it a little bit, but Britain refused to do it. Britain used their crossbow maybe once in a while during a siege, but the vast majority of the time, if they're going out of battle, they used their longbow because they were fantastic at it and they had built up the strength. There's, there's skeletons that are lopsided because that arm had been doing this over and over. Their chests were, were like birds, they owned such huge chest muscles. Uh, so it, it was something that was done, but really it was crossbow's glory is in the siege, not in the not in the pitch battle on the field, because you if you run up to somebody, their loading speeds are far too long to be on a pitch battle, where a bow is just much faster. Now at the same time, slings are equally fast as a bow, according to Xenophon. Uh, uh, historian and uh, soldier, this was his preferred thing against cavalry because it would break horses and scare them. Because when it hit a horse, it breaks bones and, it, and they yell and scream because they're horribly injured. But with an arrow, they just fall down dead. So his much preferred to do that so it would panic all the rest of the horses. And then they also want to, things have longer range than bows. But they have a little bit less accuracy at those ranges. 
They have fantastic accuracy at about 400 yards, which is the same accuracy as a, as a boat. And because slingy is, again, takes more time to train you because it's going to be a little bit harder. So they, these were, these kind of faded out. But they still were used even in uh, the Spanish Revolution in 19-something right after uh, World War II. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.